U.S. Airborne. All right. Okay, some of the uh, uniforms we have out on display, this is the dress uniform that you would have seen a uh, U.S. Army officer wearing uh, during the war. This could be worn with either a chocolate colored shirt or the uh, khaki shirt. Okay. Uh, these were often known by the soldiers as uh, the chocolates due to their color. Mm -hmm. uh, brass buttons. They have the infantry badge right here with the cost rifles as well as the U.S. Uh, rank insignia worn on the shoulders. And they yep. wore these up until uh, the end of the 50s. Nice. And what's and here on the table? Yep. Sure. Uh, this is the popularly known uh, Eisenhower jacket. This will have been worn by an enlisted soldier. You can tell the wool is a bit different. It's a bit of a coarser wool. It's also a bit more green. Yeah. Um, the Ike jacket was actually patterned after a British battle jacket that General Eisenhower enjoyed. Um, on it, we have the fourth. Uh, Army badge, as well as a corporal's insignia, and an original uh, military police brassard. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually belonged to my grandfather. Um, this is an original uh, Colt 1911 holster. It actually dates back to um, the date on the back, which is 1918. So yeah, World actually, War after World War One. Yeah, this is an older one. Yeah. Um, and this was this actual uh, holster comes from the Korean War, so this was probably used in at least two, if not three, wars. Yeah. Um, assortment of overseas caps that, they, that would have gone with the dress uniforms. Uh, enlisted one down here, or up here rather. Uh, you can see it's the same wool. Uh, the green piping on here uh, stands for military police. Okay. You also have your different khaki ones. Came in different colors, different makes and models. Uh, and then the final one down here in the chocolate, this one with just the plain gold piping, is actually for a general officer, whereas your regular officer would have had the black and gold pipe like that. Yeah. So a slight difference. Uh, we also have an assortment of the drum uniforms that would have been worn. The first ones that they would have worn on D-Day are the ones that uh, myself and Matt are wearing. This is the 42 jumpsuit. Uh, after they made it back to England, after their operations in France, they are resuited with these, which are the, uh, the 43s. Uh, this jumpsuit is a little bit different. It was originally designed to be used by everyone in the Army. Uh, it is lined, unlike uh, the 42 jumpsuit. Okay. It's also in olive drab number seven, so it's a little bit of a darker green. Yeah. Uh, this one you can see has the 82nd Airborne insignia on it. Um, this comparatively is a better combat uniform, uh, though a lot of the troops preferred the 42s because it was just a kind of sharper look to it. So even after Operation Market Garden towards the end of the war, when most of them were wearing these uniforms, many of them did switch back or try and get a hold of uh, the 42s if they were able to. Okay. Uh, some of the other things that they were issued as far as clothing, uh, just sweater for colder climates. Yeah. Uh, wool sweater. Uh, the guy that I actually represent uh, when I do this is Captain George Buecher, who was the S2 officer for the 502nd Regiment, uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment. Uh, he was the intelligence officer. So some of the things that he would carry with him, uh, maps of the drop zone, uh, maps of their destinations, some German items that they'd be able to pick up. His job was basically to uh, round up intelligence about the enemy, where they were, what their strength was, what they had, uh, so that, that information could be passed on to uh, the rest of the officers and soldiers in the regiment. Yeah. Um, this is an original 40s typewriter. Uh, believe it or not, these would end up in the field so that they could do field reports, mm -hmm. uh, so that Captain Buecher could actually type up uh, his intelligence reports and let everyone know about um, or, you know, all the information about the enemy and so on. Nice. Uh, we have an example of the guide on that would have been carried by the 502nd um, headquarters, the HQ, and you have the parachute emblem. Later on, as the war went on, uh, the parachute regiments actually had the cross rifles on it, like a regular regiment. Yeah. Uh, but early war, they had the parachute insignia. Okay. Uh, over here, we have some of the equipment that they would have worn. Um, your ammunition pouches, yep. uh, the jump gloves that they would have worn, the musette bag. Uh, the musette bag was actually a really good design in that it was worn over the top, and when they were on the ground, 
we could flip it over their head and spin it around, and they were able to access any of the stuff that they had inside. Okay. And then when they were done, they could flip it back over. This was also because when they jumped, they would have their uh, reserve chute here, yeah. their main chute on their back. This got it out of the way of the main chute. Once they landed, took their parachute off, and they were ready to go. Yeah. Um, we have some of their rations that they would have had, their food uh, came in different types. Their mess kit, of mess course. Mess kit, yep. This opens up and you have your plates, utensils, everything else in it. Uh, sewing kit for if anything ever comes apart on them. Yeah. Uh, assortment of helmets. Uh, the jump helmet was slightly different from the standard infantry helmet in that it had uh, the jump harness on here yeah. to help hold the helmet on. Um, because you don't want to have your helmet flying off. You don't want off. to fly off when you jump out of the plane. Yeah. Uh, the men were also issued a first aid, first aid pouch. Inside were bandages, uh, tourniquet, and a tube of morphine. Mm -hmm. uh, they either wore them on their helmets or clipped onto their jacket. Yeah. Uh, that was their personal choice. They would uh, wear the helmet net with pieces of uh, burlap on it, yeah. which helped to act as a form of camouflage, break up their outline. Um, another thing that they were issued on D-Day was the gas brassard, which is nothing more than a piece of paper that was coated with a chemical that, uh, in the event mustard gas or another poisonous gas was present in the air, this would actually change red. Okay. And so if this turned color red, they would know that, you know, that it yeah. was, um, that there was gas in the air. Yeah. Um, we actually have, this is what the Germans would have worn if they were in uh, the airborne versus yeah. the regular German helmet. This is a regular German helmet, uh, original from the war. Yeah. Uh, as well as the German flag and potato masher. German potato masher stick grenade. Yeah. Uh, I'll pass it over to Matt. So you can do the other half of our table. Where do we leave off there? Right in this vicinity. I was talking about German helmets. I know you know more about uh, the flag and that history. Okay, the, the flag actually was a, a, a bring back. It's an original from World War II. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've seen, I've seen plenty of these on, uh, not YouTube, but um, on actual film where you know, airborne it, troops would like it, it actually, as, as souvenirs. You see, it's actually it's a homemade piece that you know somebody crafted and manufactured themselves and had it in their own home. They were proud of their country at that point in time. Yeah. You know. Um, also within that that area right there, you know, two variants of holsters that contain for the the Walther PP. Okay. Um, also bring backs, you know, and depending on which branch of the military that they belong to in Germany, you know, designated whether it was brown or black. Yeah. Um, above the, the holsters there is a, a Hitler Youth Knife that, you know, was given to children that belonged to the Hitler Youth you know, at the, the point in time. Um, it's kind of sick in the sense of, you know, small children being indoctrinated knives. into yeah. the military, being given knives, and, you know, the idea that, that they were going to be prepared for whatever came forth. And, you know, especially like when we were in Germany in 1945, how many times guys would be going up against 13 year olds? Yeah. 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 Um, as we move a little further down the table here, we have a 60 millimeter mortar round. Mm -hmm. This round here belongs to a, uh, a bazooka. As you can see, it's actually been fired. This was a, a uh, practice round to you know go up against practicing for shooting at tanks and things of that nature. Now, how can you tell that this is a practice round? Well, first thing, it would have exploded. It actually has a, uh, uh, a shape charge up front where it's an explosive warhead. That's a rocket propelled piece. Okay. So, you know, you figure on the, the front of it, it actually, where somebody had struck something, it actually has the dent off the front of it. You know, as a, a, a practice piece there. Okay. Uh, above from this, this is an 81 millimeter mortar, much bigger than the 60 millimeter, also much heavier. It's got a mm -hmm. little bit more range to it, not as movable as the, uh, the 60 millimeter. Uh, above this, these are what's called Airborne's Riggers pouches. Okay. Basically, they store ammunition, and it was the, the airborne were known for their, you know, how much ammo can you carry, and how much can you stuff into something. Yeah. And it was definitely a non-conventional method compared to the standard issued equipment. I mean, for one thing, airborne they're dropped in pretty much behind enemy lines, and they need a lot of ammo That's to send off. As much as you can pack. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a little bit further down the line here, we have a uh, a 1911. 
45 caliber handgun, yep. manufactured primarily by Colt, but also by Remington during the war. Um, during the war, uh, due to the attempt to, to, to save as much brass as humanly possible, they started manufacturing 45 rounds actually with steel cases. Really? Instead of um, brass cases, so you can see that there's a mix of brass and steel. A little bit lower than that would be Composition C with uh, the, the blasting cap. Um, it was a lightweight explosive. The airborne would carry, you know, be able to knock off the, uh, the, the treads on tanks, mm -hmm. you know, and set up different implements and areas like that. Yep. A little bit further down, you have your, your, your classic pineapple hand grenades. Yep. And then below that is actually a uh, rifle propelled grenade that actually would be affixed to the end of a, an M1 Garand. So mm -hmm. that way you could basically throw the grenade much further distances as it was propelled by the rifle itself. Yep. Uh, as we move down the line here, we have a 1928 Thompson mm -hmm. with optional 20 and 30 round magazines. Uh, fully automatic, 45 caliber. Above that, and actually we have two different variants of M1 carbines. This is your, your, your standard infantry model M1 carbine, where this one is an airborne model M1 carbine. This actually has a foldable stock. So that it was much easier to jump out of an airplane with. Oh yeah. For whatever reason, nobody been able to find out why. Above that, we have a uh, 1897 Winchester trench model shotgun. This um, actually has the ability to affix a bayonet to the front of it. So, primarily use guard duty and actually has a favorite weapon for a lot of guys. Yes, it's Why? ability, of course, know. shotguns are the universal weapon. Yep. Above it you would be the uh, greatest battle implement ever devised. It would be an M1 Grand. Uh, it's an eight round clip, so that eight rounds right through the top. No. You know, yep. and it keep pulling the trigger until it goes empty. Eight round clip into the internal box magazine. It's got an effective range of about six to seven hundred yards, but a max accuracy out to about twelve hundred yards. Yep. And the last weapon here on the table is an M3 grease gun. Um, that was basically to compete with what we would consider to be the Schmeiser or the Sten. It's completely made out of stamped sheet metal. Mm -hmm. It's got a very, very slow cycling rate, 450 rounds a minute compared to most sub guns. Now, with the grease gun, it's supposed to um, not be a replacement, but a substitute to the most expensive Thompson. No. It's a replacement. It's a really? A replacement? Yes. Oh. Interesting. Never a substitute, it was a replacement. It was a replacement. Oh. For, because this thing cost like, I think it was like $10 to make. It was 18 It was something like that. And like that thing $18. cost like, a, that thing was like a couple of hundred. Yeah, it was like $300 manufacturer Thompson, $18 manufacturer Grease Something Scott. like that. That's why they replaced it. was substantially cheaper. And actually, it was more controllable than some of them was on the you know, first I have fired at both of them, and uh, I like the Tommy gun better. But for closeness, the Grease Gun was much better. Nice. But it, it was supposed to be a replacement, not a not a uh, open. Or whatever. And what's uh, what's on your holster? Uh, my holster here, I'm carrying a uh, Smith and Wesson Victory model, 38 caliber. Victory model. It's a six round, 38 special. <laughs> That you have the ability mm -hmm. to six rounds with your top. Nice. SMG. Fantastic display, guys. Thank you.